Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Dr. Pamela Smith, an internationally known lecturer and author who currently serves as the director of the Center for Personalized Medicine and founder of the Fellowship in Anti-Aging, Regenerative, and Functional Medicine. So Dr. Smith, what initially motivated you to study medicine? Wow. You know, I've been interested in medicine since I was 16 years of age. And I just woke up one day and said, I really want to do something that will help people and I also want to have something that will help people long term. Not a short term situation, but really for the rest of my life. And as I started looking at career approaches, medicine was an easy choice. My great grandfather was a physician and my whole family has really had a career in helping people. So at 16, I actually made that decision and applied to medical school. Was it a science class that inspired you or how did you know? Instinctly, how did you know? <laughs> oh, actually, I was looking also at law, and my grades in law were 4.6, so I had a 4.0 plus all honors courses. I was the Midwestern State uh, debate champion and as a second affirmative, and so everybody thought I was going to Harvard, and I was at a bat mitzvah, and I was sitting with one of my father's colleague's son, who was the brother of the person with the bat mitzvah. And I said, you know, I really can't decide between medicine and law. I said, medicine or law, I just can't decide. And he looked at me and he said, you don't have killer instinct. Go into medicine, you'll be a brilliant doctor. And that's the day I decided between the two. So what, I know you spent at least 20 years in the ER. How did you first wind up working in the emergency room? When I was in medical school, you rotate into different rotations. And by the second night of my rotation in emergency medicine, I was hooked. I absolutely loved it. I'm an action junkie, and I love the variety, and again, the immediacy of being able to help someone. And so when I applied for a residency program, at that time, emergency medicine was not a specialty. It became one during my training time. So I spent 20 years as an ER physician in a level one trauma center in Detroit. So what was the catalyst to make you switch to become an integrative or functional medicine specialist? I really honestly was not planning on changing careers. I loved being an ER doctor, I truly did. But one day I could not sleep. I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep and I couldn't sleep and I was used to changing shifts and not having an issue. So I started going to physicians and I ended up going to 11 of them. 11. No one could help me. They all said the very same thing. Go take a sleeping pill. I thought this is crazy. I could always sleep before. So I was really lucky. One of my partners in the emergency room, who is still my partner, so now almost just shy of 40 years, she's been my partner, said, hey, there's this new kind of medicine coming out. It's called anti-aging. Would you be interested in going to the first conference? I said, sir, Cynthia, why not? Let's go. So we did. We went to the very first one, and there I was. Second seminar, second slide. Women without progesterone frequently have insomnia. Went back, did the very first saliva test in the Midwest. I had absolutely no progesterone at all. I was very lucky. The pharmacist at the end of my block was a compounding pharmacist. Actually, I thought all pharmacists were compounders. I learned later they weren't. I went down and I said, Gary, here's my test. How much do I take? He made a suggestion. I started taking progesterone, slept like a baby in two days, and then I was hooked. For about a year, maybe 18 months, I did both, emergency medicine and starting an office. And then I left my first love, emergency medicine, and started having an anti-aging functional medicine practice. I've been very lucky. I've had two fabulous careers in medicine. I really can't tell you which one I love most, but both of them are for people who really want to help people and use science to really help people have optimal health. In this type of practice, do you still get that adrenaline rush? 
I do. I really am still an action junkie. Even though I'm in my 60s, I still am. I get goosebumps, actually, maybe as opposed to an adrenaline rush. Uh, to give you an example, one of my patients this week, it was amazing. She happened to be a fellow in the fellowship. And this was her second visit. And we started looking at her labs. And like most doctors, cortisol level not normal due to stress. But other things were not normal either. So I sort of laid out a game plan. We need to do this, then this, then this. Because you can get really excited about this kind of medicine, but a mistake you can make is to try and fix everything at one time. She was so excited when she saw the game plan we were going to do as her practice management, she started crying. She started crying. And I got goosebumps. I really did. Because you can change someone's life. And in this case, if I help her be healthier, she will help all her patients too. So it was very exciting and rewarding for both of us. I'm sure. So how many years now have you been practicing this type of medicine? 19 years for this kind of medicine, so next year will be the 20th year. And how long did it take you to fully implement this? <laughs> oh, the more I read, the more I realize there's more to know. <laughs> so I'm not sure you fully know everything. I think education is really learn where to look it up at so you know. Um, but there's always new science coming out. And that's what I love about an anti-aging functional metabolic medicine approach. You really can customize and individualize per patient. You don't have to look at just the symptom. You can look at the cause of the problem. And you can use science to help you have a healthy patient. So getting back to the fact that you went from not sleeping at all to sleeping like a baby. So how many hours of sleep do you get per night now? I used to sleep five hours a night, which is not healthy. And as I've really learned in this kind of medicine, you need to sleep six and a half to eight hours. So six and a half to seven is pretty much my average. So other than getting more sleep, how else would you say your personal life has been affected since you've made that transition 19 years ago? Well, my family lives a long time. We have longevity. My mom lived to be 91. Her grandmother lived to be 104, memory intact. How blessed. But in this kind of medicine, I really learned there's five pillars for health. And you have to have all five to be healthy and stay healthy. So pillar number one is get enough sleep. Pillar number two is to exercise. I hate exercising. I really do. I do not get the high that some people get from exercise. I'm very lucky, though. I got to meet Jack LaLanne before he passed away. He's Bob Goldman's friend. He introduced me. And Dr. Goldman said, look, you have to meet him. Maybe you'll learn to like exercise. I was very surprised at what Jack LaLanne said to me when I said, how do I learn to like this? He said he didn't like it either, but he loved the results. And I love the results of exercise. They help you maintain memory. And so exercise is key. I really have learned to eat better. I have a little bit of a sweet tooth. In fact, I have a seminar that I give in the training program here at A4M MMI that is on sugar. And I always seem to crave sugar when I get done giving the talk. But I've really learned to sort of cut back on my sweet tooth, five small meals a day, and I run great memory stays rapid fire. So how you eat matters. It also, I try and get my patients not to beat themselves up if they don't eat well, because they just have to get back on the wagon. In fact, a true story I'd love to share with you. I have a husband and wife team that I always see together. And I always let the patients choose, come in separately. Your spouse is here, come in together. Um, so uncharacteristically, he could not lose weight. Usually men lose weight faster than the women. She did. So we're going over different things. And so finally I said, hey, just get back on the wagon. And she looked at me and she said, you don't know, do you? And I said, what? I said, you know, nobody is a nun or a monk. Just get back on. She goes, I used to be a nun and Len used to be a monk. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you think That's you great. know your patients, but sometimes you don't. So eating right is key. But if people don't, we don't beat them up. We meet them where they're at, and we just get back on the wagon. So that's number three. The fourth one is to be nutritionally balanced. 
And we do know that through science and with measurement, you do have to take nutrients. As we age, we make less of some things like alpha lipoic acid, coenzyme Q10, carnitine. We actually can measure 37 vitamins in the body. We look at amino acids, fatty acids, organic acids. So we help people be very nutritionally balanced in what they can't get in food. And then the last is one of my favorite subjects, and that's hormones. In order to be healthy, and really a healthy 100 years of age, you have to be hormonally balanced. Hormones help you maintain vision, memory, and mobility, and those are the key things with aging. So we look at all the hormones in the body, from pregnenolone to estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, cortisol, insulin, thyroid, melatonin, and more. And we really help people be hormonally balanced. And without all five of those, it's very, very difficult for the patient to have optimal health throughout their lifetime. Was there ever a time, especially because 19 years ago, this was not as prevalent as it is today, was there ever a time when you wanted to give up practicing this type of medicine? Oh, no, never. I love what I do. I love what I do. Have you experienced at all any frustration along the way from whether it's it's uh, from your peers or other physicians that you had worked with in the traditional setting? Well, this is the perfect specialty for someone who was in the emergency room because in order to be an ER doctor, you have to be very self-confident. You have to really see someone in three minutes make a decision that could help them or hurt them. You also practice in what we lovingly call a fishbowl. And so people are always criticizing. They're Monday morning quarterbacking you. You have to have thick skin anyway. And so for me personally, honestly, it didn't bother me. Were there critics? Yes. But they just weren't looking at the science. Anything that you wish you had done differently over the course of your last 40 years in medicine? No. If I had my life to live over again professionally, would I change things? No. I was very blessed in the emergency room to work for Dr. Ron Crome, who is the father of emergency medicine, and with Judy Tatinelli, both of which authored the textbook. So I love my years there. Uh, a great story to share when it came to emergency medicine in inner city Detroit. We had a teenager that kept coming in all the time with pneumonia, bronchitis, strep throat, and I looked down one day and I saw bare feet and there was six inches of snow in Detroit. And I said, what did you wear here? He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, where's your shoes and socks? Do you have boots? What do you have? He didn't have any of them. He walked there in his bare feet. So that explained why he kept coming back. So we actually took up a collection in the ER. The nurses and the doctors did. We had one of the nurses go out. We bought him socks, shoes, and boots. And he came in a lot less often. So it's very exciting to be an ER doctor in a level one trauma center. But it's just as exciting to really be able to help people with science and do an anti-aging approach to medicine. Would I take back either career? No, I, I think we did it right. Are you seeing something entirely different today? You're not seeing an emergency type of patient. So do you ever miss that diversity? In the question of diversity, I have as much now as I did in the emergency room. To give you an example of just this week in the patients I saw, probably 40% were hormonal, 10% were there because they had cancer and they wanted to know what kind of therapies would, that would augment their conventional care. Um, I had many patients, probably another 30%, which are a mixed bag, where they may have thought they came in for thyroid, or they may have thought that they came in because they had an autoimmune disease, but they didn't realize that their lupus, the treatment was really going to be no gluten and let's fix your gut. Um, so, no, I have a huge diversity, huge, huge, huge. What do you hope to accomplish within your career in the next 10 years? Oh, <laughs> oh. well, in my career, I, again, I got to work for Ron Crome. It couldn't get any better than that. As far as anti-aging is concerned, not only have I been a practitioner, but I've been fortunate enough to author 10 books in the field, uh, to do TV and radio, 
and who actually found the fellowship in metabolic anti-aging and functional medicine, which is the only training program in this field in the world that's attached to a medical school. So everything that we teach in the fellowship and our training programs really are vetted by a world-class medical school. Um, so again, could I do anything better from that viewpoint? No. In the next 10 years, uh, really want to look at new studies that are out, want to really be able to find other ways to help doctors do this. And if I guess I had a goal, in 10 years from now, all doctors would be doing an anti-aging functional medicine approach where conventionally it's great if we're talking about trauma, et cetera, we are world class in the United States. We're fabulous. We lead the world. But I'd love to get everybody when it comes to chronic disease and prevention of disease to look at a functional medicine anti-aging approach. So it is, it, is it your hope that the curriculum that you've established gets rolled out on a national level to other medical schools? It is. And we're working on that right now to make this part of the curriculum. It's hard because a medical school has to stay accredited a core curriculum. Um, they can take a rotation. Um, so I actually, in my private practice, have people from five different medical schools rotating through. Uh, or as residents or fellows, but my ah, gosh, in 10 years I hope it is part of medical school and not as an add-on program afterwards. And what about you personally? If you weren't a physician, um, what, what might you be doing? <laughs> well, personally as a physician, I don't know. I have five daughters. Oh, wow. Um, How have you found the time to have <laughs> five daughters? That's incredible. Oh. Well, one of the books I wrote, What You Must Know About Women's Hormones, I really wanted to name Raising Teenage Daughters While Mother Goes Through Menopause, <laughs> <laughs> because it has been an event. New York Times bestseller, or it should have been anyway. <laughs> uh, Truly. Well, the book has done very well, but I may rewrite it and retitle it because it would be funny with such a great, great title. But personally, five daughters are always, it's exciting. Uh, the oldest one is 40. Um, the youngest one is about to be 27. Uh, so there's a wide range in, in age. Uh, I have all grandsons for grandchildren, okay. so I have now gotten the flip side and experiencing male hormones now in teenage males. It's, it's a whole different ball game. Karma. It is, <laughs> <laughs> it is but it's fun. Uh, grandkids are great. You can spoil them and return them. Uh, so I'm fortunate to have children and grandchildren. Any future positions on the horizon? Probably not for my children. Uh, I do have one that's getting a PhD in genomics and proteonomics, which is certainly an offshoot uh, of what I do. Um, one's an airline pilot for a living, and she and I commiserate that someone will actually pay us for something that we love to do. And so we're very fortunate in that area. Uh, one daughter has a master's degree in IT that she's just finishing now. Um, one is getting a master's degree in Spanish that wants to go on to get a PhD. Uh, and one as working. Uh, she did not go on to get an advanced degree because our grandson in that case was born without a functioning liver. And his projected age was 10. And very fortunately, the University of Michigan found him a liver last year, and it's functioning great. The transplant was a success. So she will go on and finish in school, but right now she's taking care of him, and Landon is a joy. So how do you spend your free time, if you have any? Any hobbies? Oh, I do. I love to needlepoint and quilt. That's, I always call my calming technique. I all go to acupuncture every week because it's great for cortisol. I like to hike and bike. And I used to be a pilot. And so not a lot of time to be a pilot anymore, so I'm not current. But in my career, uh, that, that was a major part of what I love to do as well. And maybe I'll get back to it when I retire. Although, How did you find sure the retired. time to accumulate the hours to become a pilot with five daughters and working in an ER? I became a pilot when I was 17. Oh my goodness. So my dad was a pilot in the military, and so I, th I think it's in our gene pool. Um, so I flew all through college, medical school, residency, first two kids, um, and then at that point I didn't become current anymore. So what would you say has been the absolutely most rewarding part of this journey? Personally or professionally? Let's start with personally. 
In order to be healthy, you have to be physically healthy, emotionally healthy, and spiritually healthy. So on a personal journey, I have a very strong spiritual component to my life. And it governs what I do personally and professionally. Um, so I think that's the best, is to have a great spiritual component. From the viewpoint of professional, again, I just really hope that we are able to take this kind of medicine, what I lovingly call the new medicine, personalized approach, and be able to have that accepted by all medical schools in the next 10 to 15 years. So how would you answer this question? If you knew then what you know now, what would it be? I'm going to say that I'm like my dad. When my dad was passing away, he said he had no regrets. And I'm going to say I have no regrets. So I'm not sure there would be an it. You just live every day for what it is, and you live in the moment. So I don't have any regrets. I, there's no it. So where do you derive your inspiration? My inspiration comes from my spiritual growth with the Lord. And my inspiration, aside from that, honestly, comes from my family. I have a close relationship with all of them, and just as equally from my patients. Um, I have a close relationship with a lot of compounding pharmacists. They give me a lot of inspiration as well. So everybody, everybody. Do you have a mentor, or have you had one along the way? I've had many mentors along the way that have helped me grow personally and professionally. Um, and in my books, I think in the beginning, when you do acknowledgments, I have credited all of them. It would be hard right now to single any of them out. Um, but certainly, if I had to, I guess Dr. Ron Crome for the first part of my career, and Dr. Judy Tattinelli. And for this part of my career, it would be uh, Dr. Ron Klatz and Dr. Bob Goldman. If there's two things about me people should know, it's one, I am a positive soul. I will take lemons and make lemonade every time. And probably the other one is, it's paying it forward. I'm a big paying it forward person. And so that's the two things, if you ask me, people would look at me at the end of my life, those are it. Those are incredible attributes and a, a wonderful way to live your life. Were your parents that way? How did you come to learn that? I was daddy's little girl. So my dad was probably the most positive person in the world. Uh, he was a fabulous role model. Uh, he was a fighter pilot in World War II. He did not come back to the States. He stayed in the Philippines for four years, flew for the Filipino Airlines, took the money that he had, and started a company with his brother and my grandpa. And they make storm door locks and closers. If you live in the North, you know what those are. And they basically are the second largest in the United States. So they started a company from scratch. So the American dream. Uh, I lived with at home. And it was great because when I was younger, we didn't have a lot of money because he was starting a company. So you kind of learn to start from the beginning and build something, which I think is fortunate for every child to learn. Uh, my mother was the world's best cook on earth. She was a stay-at-home mom. She drove me everywhere I wanted to be. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to debate and, and actually belong to a drama club and, and do many, many things, which uh, she drove me any place you would ask, and a world-class cook. What was your favorite item that she made? Favorite item on earth? It would be a tie between, here's my sweet tooth coming out, pecan pie and jam cake. Do you get to read for enjoyment in your spare time? I do, and surprisingly, I read a lot of free reading. And what's their last book you read? Uh, last book I read, Invisible by James Patterson. A really quick, easy read. Love Because him. you can stop and start on a plane, and the chapters are two or three pages. Um, my favorite author, James Joyce. So that's the English major in me coming out. Uh, when I was in undergraduate school, I knew I wanted to go to medical school, but I majored in English. I wanted to be a literate physician. Uh, I still go back at Wayne State University, which is where I did my undergraduate training. I still donate to the school. I still go back and work with them. Uh, we just did a seminar for pre-med students, uh, three other physicians and I, and what our career is like and how you prepare to be a doctor. We just ran that seminar at Wayne State in the last six weeks. Um, it was fun. We had a great time. 
I, just listening to you, I keep thinking perhaps most physicians, if not all physicians, should be English majors to start out, so they know how to express effectively and communicate effectively with your patients. Do you believe that that is such a strong asset and that's made you as, as um, communicative and as sensitive to your patients to be able to relate to them on their level and explain to them what a diagnosis is or a treatment plan is non-scientifically? Yes. Um, it was a dual major between English and pre-med, but would I recommend a general liberal arts education for anyone who wanted to be a physician? Hands down. I would never go back and do that part of my life differently. Um, I, I write books, I speak internationally. I could not do all of that. Uh, the other person I should probably credit is my drama teacher, uh, Miss Sally Reynolds. Uh, Sally Reynolds started, I started learning drama when I was six and did some of my professional theater. So it, probably if I'm talking about my whole life, I would have to credit her as well uh, for my ability to be able to get up and communicate. What advice would you give to a physician who is considering starting a functional or integrative medical practice or is just perhaps completing a fellowship? Well, number one, if you're just starting out, you will love what you do. Please come join us because it is the best career in the world that you could have whether you're just starting out and finishing your residency or whether you've been in another specialty area and you changed like I did. We have every specialty that is represented in the fellowship, including a pathologist from Michigan who actually is now seeing patients that are alive, shall we say. So he totally changed his life. Um, training is really important. It's hugely important. You really can't train yourself. And I think we're very blessed here at A4M MMI to have the world's best training course that there is. Again, the only one tied to a medical school. So advice, get adequate training, then you can go from there. If you have training that is credentialed, then that can take you really far. And how would you suggest that a physician initially implements this into their practice? Well, there's many different ways of doing that. Um, I really like to keep my personal model of people spending time with the clinician themselves. And so in my practice, I don't do the physical. I have their primary care doctor do that. If they don't have a primary care physician, I send them to one, and they have a physical. And then they come in and we take a very extensive history, and we customize and individualize everything with the patient. Um, so no, there really aren't any two patients in my practice that that receive the same care. It is a personalized approach. Um, so keeping that in mind if you're starting a practice, that number one, it, it's not nine to five. You really do become Marcus Welby, shall we say, to the patients. But it will be so rewarding for you and them. But the most important thing that someone should do is to have really good training before they start this kind of practice. Is there any success stories that you want to share? You spoke of a couple of them, but anything else that just is a standout? I think each patient is, should be a success story in really how you work with them. Um, one of my patients who came to see me had, she was at the end of her life and she had cancer of the liver and she was told she was going to live three months. And she said, well, what else? They told me just go to Europe, enjoy myself, that this is it. And I looked at her and I said, hey, there's a couple of things that you need to know about cancer. One thing is we all get cancer seven or eight times in our lifetime. Cancer is fed by two things, sugar and stress. So how bad do you want to live? So we looked at her diet. We looked at stress reduction techniques. We measured cortisol. We got everything balanced with the five pillars of health that we've been talking about. And she lived five years. Oh my goodness. The very cool thing is that she was a psychologist and she had closed her practice and she opened it back up. Extraordinary. That must be the most gratifying thing to happen. And does that type of thing happen with frequency? All the time. All the time. When I was in medical school, two things happened to me the first day. One. They went around and they put an NG tube down everyone's and they said, this is what it's like to be a patient. Most of you in this room probably have been really, really healthy and you've never been a patient. And this is what it's like to be one. 
The second thing was, one of the professors got up and he said, you know what, in medicine, 80% of the people that you see, you're there to give comfort to. 10% you're gonna make better, 10% you're gonna make worse. So what you need to learn in medical school is how to give comfort. The rest is all science. All of you have arrived here at the basic level of knowledge or you wouldn't have gotten into medical school. But whether you're successful or not will be how much comfort you get. I would think that that was um, far more difficult as an ER physician. If you saw trauma patients or people at, that were just in terrible shape. But I, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I, I, you must see people all the time that come into you as a last resort if they have cancer or if they've seen multiple physicians for various ailments and they haven't been able to receive an answer. Has that happened to you? It doesn't frustrate me not to give an answer because no one knows everything. I'm kind of like, well, this is how one of my patients described me. You're Dr. House, but you're not grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so basically, I really like doing the investigative part. I like to find why you may have this and what we can do. I very much enjoy the personalized approach. So I'm really, really happy as a patient that this kind of medicine is available. I'm also happy as a practitioner that I've been able to practice this kind of medicine. So from both perspectives, it's been really great that this is the time I was born in because we have so much to offer. If you had to be the patient, who would you be seeking attention from? Oh, wow. I, if I, my primary care physician is, she's fabulous. She does not enjoy this kind of medicine, so I see her for a physical exam. And we've agreed to disagree on some things, but part of that is she's a brilliant woman. She just doesn't have time to retrain, and, and that's part of the issue. If I had a cardiology problem, who would I see? Oh, hands down, Dr. James Roberts. He's a fabulous physician, world-class, number one, number one. I'm very fortunate he lives in Toledo, Ohio, so he is in my draw area and my patients are spoiled to death. Uh, he is a professor in the fellowship. We are very, very lucky to have him. Uh, so Jim Roberts, if it was a cardiological problem, and I could just go on down the line. So let's hope you have your family's genetics and you live till you're 150, or let's even say 120. Do you see yourself practicing medicine until you can no longer practice medicine, or do you see yourself perhaps teaching full-time or penning more books? Uh, I will be penning more books. Um, that I can tell you. There's probably another four in me. So there'll probably be a total of 14, maybe 16. That'll be a um, as far as practicing medicine, I can't see retiring right now. I also love teaching as much as I do practicing um, because when you teach, you can help someone help many other people. Um, so I very much enjoy that aspect too. I like coming up with new programs and new ideas and that's one thing I love about the American Academy of Anti-Aging Physicians. Everything here is cutting edge. Everything is new. The newest thing that's come out, that's exactly what we're teaching and we're educating in. So I couldn't be in a better area than looking at this field. And that's the other thing I love about this kind of medicine. Um, it's because you're not stuck with your genetic history. You can inherit a gene for diabetes. You can inherit a gene for Alzheimer's. You don't have to turn on the gene. You really don't. So you're not stuck with your genetic history, which is just fabulous. You don't have to get breast cancer even if your sister and your mother had breast cancer. We now know that part of that is related to sugar, part is related to stress, part is related to estrogen breakdown. We can measure estrogen metabolization. And so we can actually reroute how estrogen is broken down in the body, which decreases that patient's risk factor. So it's very exciting and very promising because no one has to be afraid. We can actually go back and backfill some of that so you don't have to get the diseases of your family. So you say, you know, reducing sugar, reducing stress. Well, it's easy to take your sugar out of your diet. It's easy to take gluten out of your diet. It's easy to 
potentially get on a treadmill or, or you know, or, or go run five miles outside. How do you recommend reducing stress in one's life? I always have people do stress reduction techniques. So prayer, meditation, tai chi, yoga, qigong, exercise, massage, acupuncture, breathing techniques. So there's no magic supplement? There are some magic supplements, actually. We usually give people calming herbs if they're stressed and wired. So things like chamomile, lemon balm. We also give them adaptogenic herbs, herbs that will help them deal with stress. So ashwagandha, ginseng, rhodiola. Uh, it's about balance. It's all about balance. And so a little bit of stress helps you maintain memory. What you don't want it to be is distress. So true story. I was flying on Delta Airlines one night, and Delta's been very kind to me. Um, if you fly a lot on them like you do other airlines, they'll bump you up to first class. So I was in the first class seat in 3C. I have no idea why I had a white blouse on. I don't look good in white. I usually travel in black. As you can see, I have some black on now. It hides all sins. It's, it's a great color. The gentleman in front of me in 2C wanted a glass of red wine. Oh, no. <laughs> Brand new. Yes, oh, no. Brand new bottle. The stewardess uncorked it. That entire bottle, when we hit an air pocket, went all over me. I laughed. I laughed. When I laughed, she laughed. Everybody in first class started laughing. Because if you stay stressed, cholesterol goes up, blood sugar goes up, blood pressure goes up, your immune system's compromised. You put weight on. Thyroid, the body regulator, doesn't work very well. Is it worth a white blouse for all of that? No. So I laughed. And that's really an important thing when it comes to stress. We all have it. It's about mitigating stress. And so we try and work with our patients in an anti-aging functional medicine approach to help them mitigate the stress that they have. Don't sweat the small stuff, as they say. Don't sweat the small stuff. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.